Hi everyone, thank you for coming out tonight. It's good to see a few familiar faces, though I don't know names, and hopefully if you um, continue to come, you'll introduce yourself, because I prefer to address people by their names. Um, a lot of you are here tonight to probably find out how you can um, manage your weight. I'm a big believer that diets don't work. I've had many fr friends and family members through the years on diets, and they work while they're on the diet, but as soon as they're off the diet, they put the weight on. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the science behind that, but also give you some really practical tips on how you can manage your weight and have your weight at an optimal level. A lot of you can probably relate to this. It's, I know when I see some of my friends, I've, I've got a um, colleague that's um, been on a diet now for the last four years on and off, and I really feel for her. You know, she, she beats herself up so much about her weight and she's tried so many different things and she's had a little bit of success here and there, but it's really affected who she is as a person. Um, and I think, you know, the diet industry has done a lot to our psyche and I'd like to talk to you about how to try and manage your weight and have a, a good health and vitality without resorting to diets per se. It's really about eating well for life rather than eating well just to, to lose weight for a special occasion. The trouble is there are so many conflicting diet theories out there um, and they, they really are quite conflicting and it's really hard to understand which one works and you know you might try some of these you know Weight Watchers probably is one of the more successful programs. Um, my sister-in-law um, is on the point system so I know a little bit about it but um, I also sometimes worry about that particular diet because I know when she feels like, like there's a party coming up, there's a family occasion coming up, she'll say, well, I'm going to have three drinks so I won't eat food because the drinks are going to be worth more points. And I don't know if that's really teaching her anything about good nutrition. And then, of course, you've got the Jenny Craigs and um, the Tony Ferguson, the shake diets, all of which are very, very expensive. Um, I actually checked... Um, at my local chemist to see how much Tony Ferguson shakes were and I was blown away by how expensive they are, let alone the actual um, ingredients in them which were basically all numbers. So I don't know if it's a good way to lose weight. I'm really asking you tonight to be open, to feel very, very comfortable with sharing with me. Um, I want to make this a bit more interactive. I don't want to do all the talking. I'd like you to talk to me as well. So what I'd, I'd like to do to start off with is to actually encourage you to turn to the person next to you. And I know a lot of you are with family or with friends, which is good. But if you're sitting next to a stranger, it's a good way to get to know each other. And I'd like you to just think about some of these questions. Um, you know, when did weight become a problem for you? What are some of the things you've tried? And what sort of success have you had with those weight um, strategies? To also look about what's actually causing the weight in your life. The reality is, and I know a lot of people who fit in this particular category, a lot of people who have weight problems often don't actually eat a lot. And it kind of doesn't make sense. They're eating very little food, but they're struggling with their weight. So if you could just turn to the person next to you, introduce yourself, say hi, and just have a look at some of these questions. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And I was worried that you'd um, hesitate to open up. <laughs> Would anyone mind sharing some of their stories? I mean, I, I think I mean, we're all here. We all share a common journey of health and wellness. Um, most of you are patients here. Um, you, you understand the importance of chiropractic care and holistic care. Is anyone happy to share some of their responses, what they've tried, what might have worked, or hasn't been sustainable? Hi. Hi, I'm Holly. Hi, Holly. Um, I've noticed that if I eat um, wheat and that I'll crave sugar afterwards, like for example, even if I have a salad sandwich with wholemeal bread, I crave chocolate afterwards. So I cut out the wheat in my diet and that helps me with my sugar. I don't eat sugar now, I just have like stevia or something like that. And, okay. And um, I bake with that, use um, almond meal flour, um, so yeah, I found that's helped a lot. So after I had, had two children, so had to try and lose the baby weight. So for me, that's, that's definitely helped. Thank you. So. And I'm actually going to address the role of sugar um, in diet and, and what it actually does to our bodies. Anyone else like to share? Thank you, Holly, very much. Hi. Hi, my name's Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. I think I met you last time. Yeah. Um, when I was... Um, seven, apparently they found out my thyroid glands stopped working, and, but when they found out I only had three-year-old bones, so my, my weight problem started when I was a child, and because my parents were eating eat, you know, three good meals a day, um, so that doesn't help when you're trying to lose weight, because you, you, you cycle into, um, you know, eating good meal, you know, good full meals, three-course meals at tea time and this, then I had four children, and so my struggles just continued on. <laughs> um, I did try um, Jenny Craig at one time, and I did lose weight. But once you stop, it just piles back on again. Yeah, and that's it. Mm. It's once you stop. Yeah. Because a lot of them don't actually teach you how to eat well for life. They, they're, they're all about deprivation and elimination and not doing this rather than focusing on what you should do. And I think when you live from a mentality of not doing things, then you set yourself up for, for failure. And it really is about learning what to do and to come from an attitude of positivity, um, and that is sustainable. But when you deprive yourself, as human nature, it just doesn't work. One more um, person like to share? Okay, uh, that's fine. So what I'd just like to touch on some of those stories. Now you mentioned that you, know, you lost the weight on Jenny Craig, but once she stopped it, it came back on and that's the reality a lot of the diets are not sustainable um, a lot of them too can be very alienating if you're on a special diet like if you're on the shake diet for example you've got to remember to take your shake and take your mixer with you and you know then you have all these stares when you're out in a social situation you know what are you drinking what are you doing or you're, you're taking little um, you know containers of food or you sometimes and I see this happen to a lot of my friends they actually stop socializing because they, they worry about what they're going to eat and whether they're going to set themselves up for failure because they're going to go there and they think, I haven't got the self-control so I just won't go. So I do worry that a lot of the diets out there are really, really alienating and more importantly, very, very stressful in our lives. And I want to talk to you in more depth about stress in just a moment and the role it plays. The thing is too, a lot of the diets aren't by individual. They don't actually cater for your individual health needs and your individual health um, style, your lifestyle. So again, it sets you up for failure because it's not taking into account your physical needs, um, what you do for a job. You know, if your job's very, very physical, your needs are going to be very, very different to a person who um, sits down all day or um, doesn't have quite as active a lifestyle. And your metabolism, of course, plays a big role in that. And then the cost. I was amazed when I went onto the um, Light and Easy website just for breakfast and lunch. It was $157 a week. I thought, wow, who can afford that? It, I mean, just think of the wonderful fruit and vegetables you could buy for that and have change left over to go to the movies. So, you know, Tony Ferguson, I think, was $3.60 for a, a packet of um, powder and numbers. So they're very, very expensive, and you can eat well without spending a lot of money. The reality is, too, and this, and this is probably what a lot of you have experienced, when you do go on a diet, 
and you do lose weight and you feel, wow, this has worked. Okay? And then you go off the diet and the weight comes back on. And that's because you know, our bodies are incredible. Your diets tend to, particularly when they're about um, deprivation, you end up burning a lot of muscle fat tissue rather than fat. So when you um, go back to eating normally, the fat just piles back on. It's, it's a re chemical response that's happening in our bodies. Just very briefly, just want to touch on some of the things that are contributing to our weight problems today because the reality is we are living in a, in a world where um, diabetes, the combination of, of um, obesity and, and diabetes, is really dramatically on the increase. These are just some of the things I want to touch on. And I really want to stress the importance of the first one, you know, lack of primary foods. We're all so busy doing, doing, doing. And we forget about some of the important things in our lives, our families, the things we enjoy doing, you know, the things that we get pleasure from it comes last. And we fill our life with all this stuff that we have to do and we forget about the stuff that actually feeds our soul. Because if you're not feeding your soul, it doesn't matter what you're doing for the rest of your body. I mean, I could eat really cleanly and I do eat really well, but if I don't nurture my soul and, and nurture my spirituality, everything else is just going to fall down anyway. So you've really got to look after your relationships, your family, what it is that makes you sing and you know, feel joyful. The, the reality is processed food is so readily available. Just go to your local shopping centre and go to the food mall. I mean, how many healthy choices are there? It's really hard to find a healthy choice. Even things like sumo salads, you know, have so many extra laden dressings that aren't always healthy for you. Um, and if you look, I've actually asked um, because I wanted to know. I, I, I like to be educated about my food choices. So um, I had looked at sumo salads thinking that would be a healthier choice for me if I'm caught out. But when I actually looked at the ingredients, again, they also contained a lot of numbers in their um, dressings. So they're not as healthy as they look, but certainly healthier than you know, the McDonald's and a lot of the other fast food in the food court. We're sitting down a lot too with our jobs and with our lifestyles, particularly our children. Diabetes and obesity amongst our children is dramatically on the increase. You know, they sit all day at school, they come home, they sit on a device, you know, they often do their homework lying down with their iPads and, and computers and they're not moving, you know. And a lot of that too comes from fear. We don't want our kids going outside to play because we don't feel they're safe anymore. So we're also setting our children up for weight problems. And with those weight problems, the most important thing is the health issues that arise. I love Jamie Oliver and people like him. They've done so much for wholesome food and I think what he's, the message he's trying to spread really needs to be commended. We need more people like him. My only criticism of Jamie Oliver and a lot of the, you know, the master chef is the way they present the food on these big breadboards. You know? So it looks fabulous, but we get into that mentality. We've got all the space on our plate, so we just put extra servings on. So we need, we need to be mindful, too, of, of our serving size. And as I said to you, so much misinformation out there, you know, is it low carbs, high protein, don't eat carbs after two o'clock, is it food combining, do you eat for your blood type, um, I mean, what do you do? What do you do? It's, it's just a minefield of, of, of information. And I will talk to you in more depth about the last one, because that is particularly important for um, stress management. I'm going to give you a little test. I want you to just... Imagine you've come into your house and there's this beautiful aroma of baking. Someone has baked the most delicious chocolate chip cookies. They're crunchy on the outside, soft and gooey on the inside. Yeah, chocolate's just going to melt in your mouth. Can you feel that saliva at the back of your mouth? Can you smell it? If it's not chocolate chips, it might be bread or scones or ice cream. Whatever it is that you know, is your trigger, how do you feel? You know, do you, are you, can you imagine yourself, you know, you're walking in, you know, are you going to take one? How do you feel after you've had that biscuit? Incidentally, on my website, there is a recipe for chocolate chip cookies. They're completely guilt-free. They're actually really good for you. The reality is, for a lot of people, you are going to have a reaction. But if you can learn to retrain your body 
and stop like you have, Holly, with your sugar, those chocolate chip cookies aren't going to be that appetizing. It's, it's that simple. You'll stop having those cravings. They won't do anything for you. You won't feel like that, that piece of chocolate or whatever it is. You're going to have a different reaction. And that really is the crux of our weight problems. The bittersweet truth is sugar is the number one food evil out there that is causing our weight problems. And that's where a lot of that misinformation is so confusing. I mean, if you go to the supermarket, everything's low fat, low fat, low fat, low fat yogurts, low fat muesli bars, low fat cereal, low fat ice cream. But a lot of them have lots of added sugars. And it's so confusing. And if low fat is the way to go, why do we have an increasing amount of people with weight issues? I personally believe sugar is at the crux of um, what we're doing wrong in Western society. When we think about what is actually happening, it's actually sugar that's making us fat, not fat. And we've got to really change that mindset. It's not fat that is the evil, it is sugar. So many books out there, and as I said, so many of them are conflicting. I actually tried the Atkins diet many years ago. My naturopath, believe it or not, put me on it. Um, I managed it for about three weeks, and this was the old Atkins, which was really high in protein, absolutely no carbs. I felt the worst I've ever felt in my life. It was dreadful. Um, I certainly couldn't live like that. It's not a way to live. But the reality with all of those is that if those books are working, if they're successful, why has fat consumption gone down, but our weight problems have gone up? It doesn't make sense. Something's amiss. Something's not working. We're eating a lot more empty calories. I did some research into sugar consumption, and um, the reality is if we look at sugar consumption at a world level, our sugar consumption has actually doubled since 1985. We're eating a lot more sugar. I mean, bread, you know, you, some foods you don't even think have sugar, have sugar. But whilst our sugar rates have doubled, what is dramatically incredible is our diabetes rates have actually grown tenfold. And with that, a whole range of other problems. You know, and sugar is at the crux of all of that. A book I really recommend you read if you haven't read it already, and it's actually at the Logan Library, is um, David Gillespie's Sweet Poison. David actually is a lawyer by profession. Um, he had a problem with his weight. He tried everything. He had four kids. He had another child on the way, had tried exercising, tried different... Um, he had actually tried the shakes, had tried Weight Watchers. Nothing was working for him. And he decided to actually basically set himself up as an experiment, and he cut sugar out of his diet and the weight basically melted off. The weight just dropped off. Because he realised when he actually did a historical study, when we look at our ancestors, you know, diabetes or um, obesity really wasn't a problem. It was a, a rarer thing years ago, but sugar was also a rarer thing years ago. Sugar was a treat. It wasn't something that was in all our foods, because today, of course, we're eating so many packaged foods and sugar is hidden in those foods. His conclusion, and this book is really easy to read, you know, it's, 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 it's written for the average um, person. You, you don't need to have a science background. I really recommend it as um, good reading. His conclusion was fat is not the evil, it is sugar. And if you just think of little things, you know, fruit juice. I mean, if I was to eat those nine apples, I would be feeling pretty full. Okay, and I'd also have the wonderful benefits of all the fibre that's going through my body and the pectins and so on. It'd be, I'd be feeling, I probably couldn't get to nine apples. But, you know, I have a little carton of um, apple juice or a glass of apple juice. It's not really doing anything for my appetite. But because it's being delivered in a liquid form, that sugar is going into my body and creating insulin spikes that are really messing around with my energy and really messing around with my weight. And we're getting so many calories today from liquid empty liquids, particularly things like fruit juice. You know, we kind of have this belief that fruit juice is really good for us, but it should be a very occasional treat rather than something we have daily. 
the reality is sugar is everywhere. If you were at my last talk, I spoke to you about the dangers of high fructose corn syrups. It's in everything. And it's sometimes really hard to see what we're eating because, you know, we look at the nutrition label on the back and a lot of the sugars are hidden. You know, it's even in things like cough syrup. And fruit salad, I know um, I was looking at a fruit salad at my school and I was amazed that they actually make a fruit juice syrup to put on the fruit juice and the kids are buying it but they're buying all this extra sugar when you know the fructose in the sugar in the fruit is enough for them they don't need that sweetened syrup that they're putting on that on that um, fruit it doesn't make any sense the reason that there's so much sugar in our foods particularly the high fructose corn syrup it's a great way of preserving our foods so it gives all our food a much longer shelf life fiber is very very um, quick to go off. So they take a lot of the fibre out of our food and fill it with synthetic stuff to keep the shelf life um, longer and make the product more sustainable. I just want to show you the average sugar consumption here in Australia. Um, and there's been people that are doing a lot more than this. The average Australian is consuming around about 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. The average Australian child, unfortunately, is consuming around about 32 teaspoons of sugar a day. It's a lot of sugar. And I can tell you, as, as a teacher, what sugar does to children, you know, what it does to their academic results, let alone their health. I see it every day, you know, after lunch, the, you know, the kids just want to put their head on the desk and go to sleep. And, you know, you ask them what they've eaten, you know, and they, well, we don't sell soft drink at my, at my school, but sugar's in everything they're eating, you know, the muesli bars, the sandwiches, because the bread is so processed, you know, we're all eating white bread. Males in particular are eating a lot of sugar. You know, if we look at it as a gender thing, males are consuming a lot more sugar. You know, women are more into the diet drinks and the diet foods, uh, men are not so much. And I just can't stress enough, everyone, that diet foods are just as bad as foods with sugar in them. You know, if you're having synthetic sugars, you're still tricking your body into craving that sweetness. And the dangers of, of artificial sweetness, stevia is, is, a, is a better um, sweetener, it's, it's natural. But please don't get into that, you know, the diet coats and the diet Pepsis. Mine, myself, if I was to, you know, feel like a soft drink, and I remember at Christmas Day I actually wanted a glass of lemonade. I had a glass of lemonade with the sugar in it. I would never, ever have a diet drink. I just don't want all that stuff in my body. Yes. Anyone? And um, they actually told her she'd be better off having sugar than, than having those. Yes. And I totally agree. Yeah. And she went straight off it and went back onto, you know, she doesn't have a lot because she's got used to, to, to not having sugar. But if she has a bit of cereal or something, she'll have like normal sugar because they've said don't touch the, the, the synthetic stuff. And of course, you shouldn't be having any sugar on no. a cereal because the cereal itself is so full no, of sugar. Um, if you're buying proper natural oats, but if you're buying the ones that you're putting in the microwave, yeah, yes, I it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I know my father, and I shared this story with some people last time. My father was in hospital, um, actually been in hospital three times the last couple of months because of diabetes. So I know firsthand. I've seen it as you know, my dad's daughter, and he won't listen, and he struggles because the doctors actually give him very conflicting advice. I know after his. Um, second last surgery when he had a blood sugar reading of 19.2 the nurse brought him a bottle of orange juice and a sandwich and white bread you know when I challenged her very politely of course um, she said oh but it's okay there's no sugar in it I've made sure it's it's hundred percent fruit juice you know because fructose is not sugar is it um, to try and explain to you very simply what happens when we consume a lot of sugar, and it doesn't have to be, you know, the white sugar. It has the sugars in all our foods. What happens is that we're having all these spikes in our sugar levels in our blood. Okay, it's going up and down, up and down. And that spiking is what makes us hungry and what makes us crave, like that chocolate chip cookie. You know, that, that extra slice of bread, you know, that bread roll with your dinner even though afterwards you think, you know, why did I do that? I didn't actually really enjoy it, but you had it anyway. 
when our blood sugar spikes, the, the reality is it messes around with our insulin levels and with our pancreas. I'll explain it very simply to you like this through a diagram. When we eat, our pancreas, which is a gland in our um, abdomen, makes insulin. Okay, so it's there for a reason. But if we're eating the wrong sort of foods, that insulin is spiking. And what ends up happening is that our cells try to fight that insulin spike. Our, our bodies are designed to, you know, to look after itself. Because our body is fighting, because we've just had too much sugar, that sugar then turns into fat because our livers can't process it. Our livers can't um, process that sugar in our body and it actually turns into fat. The pancreas is a really important gland and it's there for a reason and it's, it's a chemical reaction in our body that's essential to our survival. But when we, but, but it's like going on a, um, on a journey and you know that you know, you've got to go um, a particular way, you've, you, you've got to go from say north to south and you think oh, I'll take a deviation because if I turn this way it's going to be quicker. Um, and you kind of end up taking longer because you know you've gone off course. But if you'd gone down the freeway, or gone down the M1, you would have got there. But you, you know there was an accident on the freeway. You heard it on the radio, so you try to avoid it, and everyone else has done the same thing, and just stuck in traffic anyway. Our pancreas gets so confused when we don't feed it properly, and those insulin spikes cause our liver to t to basically take that and turn it into fat as as a survival mode. The reality is that glucose in any form, whether it is from 100% fruit juice, just turns into fructose, which turns into fat. Our livers can't process it. There are two types of fat. You know, there's the subcutaneous fat and there's the visceral fat. The, the visceral fat is the fat we should be worried about, and that's our belly fat. And that's the fat that a lot of us struggle to lose. It's actually a really dangerous type of fat. Not all fats are equal. That type of fat causes heart problems, stroke, gallbladder problems, and it's very, very resistant to dieting. You know, we often see pictures and ads on, on television, um, particularly with males, you know, who are struggling with that weight around their stomach. It's a very, very evil type of fat, and you need to address it. You can't just think that, you know, I've got a weight problem, I need to lose weight so I can fit into my clothes. It's, you need to lose that belly fat because it's causing you to decrease your life expectancy and, and let alone your energy levels and so forth. It's really, really dangerous. The link between belly fat and um, pancreatic cancer, um, colorectal cancer, um, breast cancer, there's a lot of studies. Have a look online. I've actually given you some links to videos too that you can view on your handout that backs a lot of this up. I want to talk to you a little bit about stress. People don't realise the role that stress actually plays in weight. And that's why a lot of diets don't work, because it actually causes us to be more stressed. Because we're always worrying about you know, what we're going to eat. Stress causes cravings, because what ends up happening is our body produces more cortisol. Okay, so our adrenal gland produces more cortisol. And that cortisol is a sugar mo uh, mobilising hormone. But when we have too much sugar, when we're eating the wrong foods, that cortisol gets out of whack and it actually produces more cortisol. And along with the uh, pancreas producing too much insulin, we've got the, the cortisol doing one thing, the insulin doing another thing, and it causes all these cravings in our body. You know, and it's not that you're craving you know, a big bowl of kale salad. You know, you're craving something wrong and you know it's wrong and then you feel guilty afterwards and that guilt causes more stress. We don't want to have increased cortisol production. It's really bad for our weights, but it's really, really bad for our hearts, for our health, for our blood pressure, everything. You know, it's a ticking time bomb. You know, yes, from a vanity point of view, you need to worry about cortisol because it, you know, it's linked to, to um, weight. But more importantly, you want to worry about it because it's very much linked to poor health and health problems that cause death and cause poor quality life. You know, if you don't um, die, like if you might have a stroke, you know, then you have to live with the side effects of that stroke, which might be loss of mobility or speech. Correct it. 
you know, so many of those problems are preventable through diet. You need to look at what's causing that um, cortisol production in your body. You know, I know myself that um, when I'm very stressed, uh, I can feel it. You know, I, I feel it. My, my stress is in, always in my neck. That's, to me, is always a trigger. Um, and I know that I need to do something to manage that stress. Because if I don't manage that stress, it leads to other problems, okay, headaches. And um, John knows a lot of my, um, I, I, I'm a client here just like you are, and a lot of my chiropractic needs come because I hold stress in my neck. Uh, and when I'm particularly stressed, it, it goes there. And I've got to be very mindful of that, of correcting stress in my life. If you haven't done one of John's meditation classes, I really encourage you to sign up for a meditation class. I was actually saying to John, I've had a really busy day today. I, I started very early this morning at 5 o'clock and it's just been a go, go, go day. I had a, um, a meeting before this and uh, I was on the, driving on the freeway and I just needed to um, unwind. So I actually did a, a meditation on the freeway. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was very, very conscious of where I was driving. Um, but there are ways too to do meditations where you're not actually you know, sitting in a chair with your eyes closed or lying on a bed. And I really encourage you to make meditation a big part of your life. Cortisol also causes your muscle tissue to break down. And the reality is, um, you know, when your muscle tissue is breaking down, muscles actually use seven times more calories than fat tissue does. So if you're breaking down your muscle tissue, you're more predisposed to putting on the weight. You don't want the muscles breaking down. Studies show that a lot of overweight people, particularly who are carrying the weight around their bellies, have very high cholesterol, and that's coming a lot from the, from the cortisol production. It creates that vicious cycle that I was talking about before. Our bodies produce adrenal, you know, we, we go into a fight or, or flight mode to survive, and it's this constant pulling, it's like a rubber band, you know, and if you pull it too much, eventually that rubber band is going to break, and the same thing happens to our bodies. Let's talk about some of the practical things you can do to actually make weight management a lifestyle. Okay, the way that you live always. Not a diet to fit into that dress for that wedding, you know, or that special occasion, but for life, for vitality, for health. You know, so that you, you do get out, out of your bed in the morning, you just look forward to the day. Get used to cutting back on sugar. And I really admire, Holly, what your story in sharing that. You know, you've recognised that for you, a big trigger is wheat. Um, you know, wheat does cause sugar production in our body. The wheat that we grow today is nothing like the wheat that our ancestors grew. You know, it's, it's designed for maximum wield, uh, yield. Um, there's some great books out there on, on the dangers of wheat in, in our health. My recommendation is that you should not have more than 10 grams of, of carbohydrates or sugar in your food servings. But please note, not all sugars are equal. You know, obviously 10 grams of refined sugars are not the same as 10 grams of, of sugar coming from a complex carbohydrate like rice. And you look at the nutrition label, I mean that label up there shows you that there's um, seven, I think it's seven grams of um, I'm going to look at the screen. I can't quite see that one up there. Is it seven grams? Yeah. So that looks like a really healthy choice, okay? And, you know, the fat content is low. Not that that's something I would worry about. It's more looking at the saturated fats and the trans fats. You don't want to be eating any trans fats. But then if I actually, you know, have a look properly at the label, and I looked at a cereal packet, well, there might be, you know, 10 grams or less of sugar, but then when I look at the sugar content, you know, not all sugar is equal. There's a lot of extra sugars in the cereals that we eat today. There's very few sugars. I know this because I actually, the last workshop, I actually went to the cereal aisle and really did some study into it. Um, and there wasn't a single cereal out there in the supermarket that I personally would eat, uh, other than porridge, um, which is a good way to start your day. So. Avoid foods um, where there are more than four ingredients. And I spoke last time at the last workshop about you know, eating whole foods. Um, I love the concept of the four ingredients cookbook. Um, I haven't actually looked in, in depth at the book, but keeping it simple. You, know, you don't want to be eating foods where there's 
you know, it's almost like a science experiment on the back of the label. There's so many ingredients, it's half the time you can't even pronounce them. Get used to chewing your food. I mean, I know my mother growing up would always say to us kids, you know, chew your food, you know, and she actually had it right. Chewing is such an important way to control your weight. You know, our stomachs can't do the chewing. The chewing happens up here. Saliva is really, really important. Saliva breaks down the enzymes that, you know, gets into our digestive tracts and actually allows, very importantly, the nutrients in that food to be absorbed. You know, a lot of people who um, are eating a lot aren't absorbing nutrients from their food, but often it's because they're chewing their food too quickly. And a lot of that too comes because we're not mindful when we eat. You know, we're eating over our computers or over our iPads or in front of the television. I actually asked some students today um, how many students sat down at the table and ate as a family. This is a class of 32 and four children put their hand up. I, I teach um, year 12s mainly. Four children out of 32 and that was only on the weekend. You know, and when I said, well, you know, where do you normally eat the food? They're eating it in their bedrooms, over their computers, over their iPads. Families are doing the same because we're all busy. And you've really got to eat that food. The other th uh, chew that food. The other thing is, too, when we chew, it breaks down those enzymes so we're absorbing the nutrients. So we've, it's actually going to help us to feel full rather than feel hungry. If you see someone who, ch who chews their food very, very quickly, and they might eat a really big meal, you know, an hour and a half later, they're hungry again because their body hasn't actually absorbed any of the nutrients. So they're not getting that full signal in their brain. The um, chewing breaks down the enzyme that allows those nutrients to be absorbed. And very importantly, for those of you that have issues with bloating or um, constipation or gut or belching, you know, that things we don't like to talk about, like society, but it happens. A lot that comes from not chewing our food. So we're, we're actually creating a lot of gas in our body because the enzymes, the digestive enzymes are not working. So it's really, really important to chew your food. Um, you know, my grandmother used to say, you should be chewing your food around about 30 times a mouthful. And I think, you know, when you're first starting, if that's something you're not doing now, sitting there and actually counting how many times you chew your food is actually a good way to start. You actually want to liquefy the food in your mouth, particularly to get those benefits. That's why things like green smoothies are so wonderful for you because you're liquefying it and you're getting it into your body very, very quickly. You're breaking down the sugar content so that your body's not absorbing the sugar directly into your bloodstream and causing those insulin spikes. So chewing is really, really, really important. I spoke to you about stress, what it does. You know, if you were to be encountered, you know, with something, um, I actually had a, I probably should have put a different picture up there. I had an experience a number of years ago where um, I was swimming and looked up and there was a shark. And I'm not actually a very good swimmer. Um, I didn't grow up in Australia, so I didn't learn to swim. And in fact, I really can't still swim very well. Um, and I, of course, went into a bit of a panic mode, like, oh my God, there's a shark there. And it was definitely a shark, it wasn't a dolphin. Um, and I'm just very fortunate that um, I had the sense not to you know, lash out madly. Um, and I'm glad I didn't do that because there was also a stingray um, underneath me. Um, I was actually swimming in an area that we had been told not to swim in. So I was really, really silly. This was in my early 20s when I was invincible. Um, I, I basically floated. I floated back to shore and it was a really, really hard thing to do because your instinct, your adrenaline kicks in and you want to run. And adrenaline's a really good thing. You know, it keeps us away from danger. But if we are stressed constantly, then that adrenaline is not a good thing because we're always fighting. We're always in that fighting the bear, fighting the shark, you know, fighting the um, person that's broken into our house. It's always that type of living that we're doing. It's not a, a very good thing. We need to do more things to wind down and catch up. Find what it is, like for me, um, I'm a bath person. Every Friday night, I have a bath. Okay, I put on a bit of Andre Bocelli in the background, I light some candles, and I unwind. And I look forward to that. Okay, it's something that just helps me. And I'm really, really quite um, greedy about that now. I won't, 
other than Andrea Bocelli coming to my house and taking me out, um, I wouldn't give up a night in the, in the bath for, you know, it's just such a way for me to recharge my battery. So find what it is that causes you to unwind and do it regularly. You need to make a part of your day where you're not doing, that you're just unwinding. Otherwise you go to bed too and you struggle with your sleep and let alone your weight. The thing is you've really got to reduce your stress as if your life depended on it because it actually does. You know, stress is so much linked to heart problems, stroke problems, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. You have got to get rid of the stress in your life. And again, I encourage you to do one of the meditation classes that John offers here. Um, there are lots of free online uh, meditation apps you can download to your smart devices or, you know, Logan Library. And Logan Library is actually a really impressive library. You've got some great meditation CDs. They've got ones that you can take with you when you're walking. There's so many ways of doing meditation. You know, you, I, my meditation actually is most successful when I am walking. I like doing walking meditations at the beach. So find what it is that helps you to unwind. Put, do, put things into your life. Okay, put the primary food. That number one thing that I said was the big cause of weight problems. Put more of that back into your life. If you haven't tried journaling, journal. You know, write down your thoughts. It doesn't have to be like, you know, dear diary. Just write down your thoughts. Sometimes just writing them down is enough to help that stress to go out of your body. It's also a nice way too to um, bring back some of those good memories. I'm a big journal. I've journaled since I was a kid. And I, I sometimes look back at my journals and I have some really beautiful memories of things I've written down. And then some of the more painful things I think, wow, have I changed? Have I grown as a person? So you know, try journaling if you haven't. And if you're more into tech, there are some great um, apps too for journaling. I'm old fashioned, I like writing. Try yoga. You know, that's also a great way to, to um, unwind. Eat mindfully. You know, if you take nothing else from tonight, eat mindfully. You know, the old fashioned saying, grace, you know, being thankful for your food, it's there for a reason. You know, that food is nurturing us and loving us. And know what you're eating. You know, feel every taste in your mouth. Don't ever sit there and eat in front of the TV or on the phone or in front of a device. Eat mindfully. Even when I'm eating by myself, I sit at the table. I actually set myself a little place in that and I sit and I eat mindfully so I can enjoy my food. Sleep's really, really important. And there's been so many studies done into sleep. Sleep um, keeps our leptin levels high and we want our leptin levels to be at the right level so that we don't go into those cravings. People who have poor sleep or who you know, burn the midnight oil or um, pack more into their days, and I know I can be guilty of this too, when I'm going through a particularly busy time, it's sleep for me that suffers and I feel it in every part of my body. It doesn't matter how many green smoothies I'm having, if I'm not doing this, that's not going to help. So it's really important that you keep your sleep quality under control. You know, don't take electronic devices into your bedroom. You know, televisions don't belong in bedrooms. You know, there's only two things that should be happening in your bedroom and you can work out what that is. You don't want your leptin levels going up and down because it's really, really bad for um, weight management. Very importantly, it sounds like so much like common sense and that's what weight management is. Eat foods that you like. And you have to eat foods that you like. That's why some of the diets don't work. I actually tried one of the Tony Ferguson um, shakes. I bought one. I mean, I wanted to see what it was like. They're bloody awful. <laughs> Yuck. I don't know why you'd want to do that two or three times a day, every day. Food should be enjoyed. You know, the pleasure of actually breaking bread with someone and eating with someone is a beautiful thing. So find foods that you, uh, you like and make it a normal part of your life. I'm a big believer in swapping out the bad and swapping in the good. This is just a photo of some of the food that I make on a regular basis. I make burger and chips. Okay, I, I have kids, they like burger and chips. Those chips are raw, made from sweet potatoes, they taste amazing, and those burgers are made from cashew nuts and also taste really amazing. No bread, two types of cheeses there, cashew cheese and macadamia cheese, and honestly, whenever I make them, there's never any left. So it's just about swapping out those bad things and replacing them. You can still have chocolate, 
but it's about making good quality chocolate. You can have those chocolate chip cookies, but you know, packing them full of superfoods, not the sugar. So swapping out those bad foods and finding foods that you like. Trick your body, and at the same time, treat your body. Get back to the old-fashioned flavouring your food with natural herbs. You know, sprinkling some parsley, some cinnamon, some cloves, coriander, turmeric. All of those foods flavour, also all of those herbs flavour our foods, but they also act as a very um, important role in that a lot of them are anti-inflammatory. You know, turmeric's a wonderful thing to be putting into your body. It tastes great, but it's a great anti-inflammatory for your body as well. So is ginger and, and things like that. And if you start flavouring your foods and you eat a lot more vegetables, vegetables are actually very, very sweet already. And if you learn how to, to cook them well, like, for example, if you bake um, pumpkin, it'll sweeten naturally. So you don't need, you know, all the extra sauces and white cheese sauces and all that sort of stuff on it. Root vegetables are so sweet. Those um, chips I had before, you know, were just made from sweet potatoes done in a dehydrator. Really, really nice. Eat healthy snacks. Okay, be prepared. I'm a big believer in that um, you, know, you should be eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And my breakfast is very early in the morning, and um, I pack a lot into my day. So I carry a lot of snacks with me. I have snacks everywhere. I, I'm a, I prepare a lot on the Sunday. So little bags of trail mixes, nuts, seeds. You want to try and make sure your fats are containing a good fat. So your, your snacks are containing a good fat, a good protein source and they will actually help you to feel full. You don't obviously go for a big bag of um, Nobby's cashew nuts, you know, full of salt and so forth. Make your own cashew nuts, you know, you can flavour them yourself. Roast some chickpeas in the oven, um, you know, they taste beautiful. Put some turmeric in, in with them. Make your own kale chips, um, packed with calcium, packed with iron, packed with protein. And you can have all those snacks and not resort to the bad snacks. It's just about preparation and, and getting yourself organised. It's really important that you do eat more protein, um, good quality lean protein with low GI foods and good fats. Okay, that is the formula for all food. Every food should have a good protein, a good fat and low GI. And I do stress it needs to be a good source of protein. Protein helps to stabilise our um, blood sugar levels and as I said before, um, protein burns um, calories more efficiently. So it, it, it helps us to manage our weight. That's why a lot of those protein shake diets are so successful, but because they're not educating you about how to eat, when you go off the protein shakes, you put the weight back on because you haven't learned how to actually prepare food. Um, protein's essential too for our adrenal glands to function well and to cope with stress in our lives when things do go out of whack or when we, we're hit with a situation that is particularly stressful. Um, as I said too, it also stops our insulin levels spiking. The insulin is the thing that's causing the cravings. You know, if you're not eating protein in the morning, for example, you know, having a bowl of porridge, by 10 o'clock, you know, you're reaching for a coffee, you're reaching for a chocolate chip cookie or a chocolate bar or, or something snacky because you're feeling flat. You know, mid-afternoon you get that flat feeling. Protein fills us up quickly but it stabilises our, our blood sugar levels. It's a, just a great way to manage your weight. So many people who diet, this is the meal that they miss. You know, you really need to eat breakfast. A research study was done, um, and I've put the quote up there um, just a couple of years ago, and they found that people who actually maintained their weight loss, okay, kept the, the weight loss off, 78% of that um, control group ate breakfast every day and they had protein in their breakfast every day. Breakfast is really, really important. You know, it's called breakfast for a reason. You know, we're breaking a fast. It's an important part of our day and we, we need to be eating a healthy breakfast with a good protein source and a good low GI. Um, you know, so a, a vegetable smoothie, a boiled egg, um, a bowl of oats, but having a good quality breakfast is a very important way to start our day. Drink. Water, though. Okay? 
Our bodies are made up of water. Our, our brains are actually about 80% water and our bodies are made up of um, about 70% of water. So we need to be hydrating all the time. And the thing is, often when we reach for food because we think we're feeling hungry, we're actually dehydrated. And often if you are having problems with your weight, if you were to simply take a drink of water and hydrate your body, that feeling of the food actually goes away. Your body's confused, it's sending out the wrong message. You really need to be drinking more water. Um, John would have spoken to you in, in some of the um, classes too about you know, the importance of water in your diet for your bones as well. You really have to drink lots and lots of water regularly. Move. If you haven't seen the wonderful Sue, I would really encourage you to make a time. Come to one of her classes. Sue knows your chiropractic needs, she knows your lifestyle, but you've got to move your body. You don't need to go to the gym, you don't need to be a gym junkie, but exercise should be a normal part of your life. Whether it's walking, doesn't matter, but you need to move. It's important that you move on a regular um, level, regular um, basis, doing some sort of physical movement every day. Again, it's, it's about keeping insulin down, okay, and keep regulating our blood sugar levels. Embrace good quality fats. I made a, um, I did a food demonstration today, um, and I purposely didn't tell the children what was, I was doing, and I had so much interest. And it was a, it's actually the recipe on your um, handout. Um, and I did it with the, the kids today, and I had like 17-year-old boys there, you know, and. When they saw the avocados come out and they realised the avocado was the main ingredient in this chocolate pudding, they were like, ooh. And then they tasted it, you know, and they loved it. So it's, it's really about embracing good fats, you know, avocado, coconut oil, butter. You know, I'm, I believe butter is much better for you than um, margarine, which is made in a laboratory. I'm not saying that you should be eating lots and lots of butter, but you should be eating good fats. I have about 20 to 22% of my diet every day is good quality fats. If for some reason um, I haven't got time to prepare food, I will actually add coconut oil into my smoothie. Add fats back in, okay? Fats are not the evil, sugar is the evil. I'd really encourage you, um, Walter Ullett was actually one of my lecturers in my um, study. Very, very, very learned expert on the wonders of fat in the diet and the benefits of putting good fats back into the diet for health reasons, let alone for weight management. Uh, I'd encourage you to write his name down and, and have a look at some of his work online. He has his own website. He actually found that people who ate more fat but had good quality low GI foods could actually eat an extra 300 calories a day and not gain weight. So good fats are really, really important. Just talking a little bit more about good fats, don't fear it. It's not an evil. You know, the old me, I know um, I've actually, I guess in a lot of ways, been lucky in that I haven't had a weight problem in my life. But I know I went through um, hormone changes very early. I actually developed osteoporosis in my early 30s. And my hormone levels changed. And for the first time in my life, I had to start thinking about what I would, was eating. And, for the first time in my life, I actually understood how people who have weight problems who are on diets live. Um, because I used to think, oh, it's just about control, you know, why can't people stick to a good eating plan? And I realised it was much, much harder than it looks. But when you're eating the right foods, it actually becomes very easy. And the old me, like when I started to, um, I, I put on about five kilos when I was going through um, hormone changes very early in my life. And I, five kilos may not sound like a lot, but for me it was a huge amount of weight because I just had always had the opposite problem trying to maintain a healthy weight. I now eat a lot of fat, okay, and I feel better for it. I certainly know my body feels better for it and um, my skin's better. Everything's just better with good fats in your diet. Eat fat at every meal. You know, whether you add some olive oil to your salad or your veggies or coconut oil, but you should have fat in every meal. That's not a hint to go down to McDonald's. Good fats, okay? Big difference between good fats and bad fats. If you 
are not vegetarian or vegan, then certainly get some um, good animal fats from good quality organic eggs, lean chickens, grass-fed beef. Um, I do stress though, if there are a lot of good protein sources without having to eat um, animals. Kale, for example, is very, very high in protein. I believe this is the way that we should all use the scales. Okay. Okay, good way to, you know, get a little bit of exercise, do some leg lifts. I think, you know, going into the bathroom or wherever you set your scales up and looking at it every morning and giving that horrible feeling in your, in your body, what a way to start the day. You know, start the day feeling guilty. We've been doing it wrong. Okay, banish the scales. Go, go by how, how your clothes fit. You know, scales, you don't need them. Look at getting some support um, in what you're doing, um, whether it be from a family friend, um, partnering up with someone, taking on a coach, um, but it's really important to have someone on board. Um, you were saying before about your family having very big meals. It's really hard if you're trying to do the right thing and everyone else is you know, tempting you. So it's really important that you have someone in your life that can support you, not on a diet, but on a lifestyle change. If you um, do want to um, speak to me a little bit more about my coaching services, you're very welcome to go on, online and have a look at my website. Um, I do offer a free initial consultation. I do that by um, getting a very detailed health history from you. Um, I do look at the way you live, what you're eating, to offer you advice. And the reality is, guys, I want to conclude with this before I open up to question. If you're eating real food, you don't need to worry about dieting ever. Any questions? Don't be shy. Thoughts? Uh, I was reading about um, your articles, you know, you wrote in your um, website, so you know, about name? the prayer. Right. Um, and that was about the coconut oil, you know, you don't, it never go out of date, you know, so you can keep it, use it as long as you have it. Yes. About, you know, how about the temperature, you know, should you keep it in a fridge, so is it okay in a room temperature? No. Um, you'll find now that it's getting cooler, um, your coconut oil will actually harden. So mm -hmm. coconut oil hardens at about 20 degrees. Um, there's no need to store it in the fridge. I mean, I go through coconut oil so quickly it's never going to go off, but it um, actually has a very, very long shelf life, um, particularly if you're eating pure virgin coconut oil. It's when you start eating the refined oils that they go rancid. Um, olive oil doesn't have such a long shelf life, which is why if you're buying those type of oils, olive oil is, is a good oil, but you need to be making sure that you store it correctly. It needs to be in a dark bottle, um, because once light starts getting to the oil, it will actually go off. But coconut oil is really, really good for you. Not just for, as a food source, but also good for your skin, um, good for your hair, a great moisturiser. Ladies, it's great for taking makeup off. Um, it's, I've actually treated my niece, um, had a lice problem. Her mother had tried, my, my sister had tried everything. Used coconut oil, got rid of the nits, the lice haven't come back. So many wonderful things you can do with coconut oil. It really is a superfood. It's had such a bad rap because people see it as saturated fat, but it's a medium chain um, molecule, and the way our body absorbs it is very, very different to other types of saturated fat. So it's, it's a good fat to be having in your diet. Any other questions or comments you'd like to make? Hi, Holly. Hi. Um, what do you think about soy? Soy, as in like um, any soy. Like I personally don't like it. I'm but... not a big fan of soy. Um, I do believe that soy can be of benefit to you, but you really need to check your sources of soy. Fermented soy, no problem with. Yep. So you know, tofu and things like that. As long as they're fermented, they're fine. I'm not a fan of the soy milk that we sell in Australia. It's so refined, so manufactured, so heated. It's, it's look. If I had to choose between a glass of dairy milk and soy, I would go for the dairy over the soy. Nine of them, by the way, are actually good for you, but the soy is it's, it's not good. It's so um, heated, so processed, so it's full of ge genetic um, GMOs. 
Did anyone follow the, the Supreme Court? Um, I, I followed it because I'm a, a legal studies teacher, so I love the law. Um, but we just had a Supreme Court challenge where a farmer in Western Australia challenged another farmer who was mm. using um, sprays and had, had seed that was genetically modified. And he was concerned that with wind and so forth, that his, he was an organic farmer, that it was going to cross-contaminate. And he lost the, the appeal at the um, Supreme Court. Now, that's opened up a huge precedent in Australia. You know, we're one of the few countries in the world where we still don't have a big problem with genetically modified um, foods in our crops. But now that the Supreme Court has allowed this ruling to go through, you know, what's happening with Monsanto in the United States? And if you're buying foods, you know, that have corn as the main ingredient, you're eating GMOs, soy, if it's full of GMOs. Well, that's what I was like when I've seen packaged food. It's all about that soy with the inner whatever it's called in there. So, yeah, you, it really needs to be a good quality organic source. And you need to be asking the questions. As I said before, you really need to start reading your labels, looking at the nutrition contents, and keeping your foods as simple and as clean and as you know back to nature as, as possible. I personally don't eat soy. Um, I have a son that lo loves soy. He's, we're all vegetarian. Um, but I make sure that when I'm getting him soy that I do get um, fermented soy. I, d I just don't like the taste of it. I, it's, but I also don't particularly believe in it as a, as a quality food. What about goat milk? Goat milk, um, if you have a problem with... Goat milk is a much better product than um, dairy milk. Um, there are wonderful benefits from drinking goat, goat milk. It is very high in calcium. It is an acquired taste. Goat cheeses, I cert certainly go over goat cheeses over your um, dairy cheeses. I have to share a, a, a funny story with you over goat's milk. Um, about um, Maltese, and about um, six years ago I was in Malta in summer, and if you think it's hot in Australia, you haven't felt anything. Okay, Maltese summers are extremely hot. Average day is about 43, 44 degrees. Really high humidity. It's right near Africa, so you get those African um, humidity. And I was so hot. This is before I became um, you know, almost, not, I wouldn't say nasty, I just like eating clean food. I used to eat dairy. Cause I, as I said, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis when I was 32, so I had it very young. So I was very mindful of you know, eating lots and lots of dairy. And I went into um, a little shop and I asked for um, a banana milkshake. And um, I saw her go out. And in Malta, they don't have fly screens. They have those screens, you know, made of those plastic yes. to stop the fly. And out she goes and she gets down her hands and knees. And there's the goat <laughs> straight into the cup. And then she gets a banana and she mashes it in. I tell you what, oh my God. <laughs> I paid for it and I thanked her, um, but I can honestly say I, I didn't try it. It was a little bit too fresh for me. It was, and it was also very warm. Yeah. I could actually feel the warmth of that milk in the cup. So that was actually the last time I um, had a close encounter with goat's milk. And I think it left me scarred for life. But I do like goat's cheese. What's your preferred substitute for milk? I eat a lot. I eat. I drink a lot of almond milk. Almond, almond milk, than um, and I also drink a lot of coconut milk. Um, almond's my preferred choice because it has greater um, calcium content. It's very, very easy to make. Um, almond milk, you don't need to be buying it though. Now that a lot of us are actually, and this is the wonderful thing about the consumer, we drive what manufacturers make, and we're all becoming more conscious of what we eat. You know, three or four years ago, um, it used to, I know when I first started drinking almond milk, I used to pay $9 for a litre of almond milk. So I learned how to make it myself because I wasn't going to pay $9. But you can now buy it for around about $3.60. Of course, don't get the almond milk that is sweetened. Okay? You know, if you're going to buy it, make sure it's an unsweetened um, milk. But it's very easy to make. Just It's a cup of almonds soaked overnight. Um, I use a ratio about 1 to 3. You can do 1 to 4. I just like a little bit creamier. Throw the water out in the morning, put it in your blender, and then put it through... Um, get a nut milk bag from Flannery's across the road. You can just use the chucks to, to sieve the um, pulp. And you've got beautiful almond milk. And then the pulp it gets made into other things. Okay, like those chocolate chip cookies I was talking about, it's made from the excess from the almonds. So high protein cookie, but um, I don't waste anything. I've learnt to um, use everything. 
Um, even today when I made the um, avocado mousse for the children, um, I made sure that I saved the seeds and, you know, they automatically went to put them in the bin. The seeds are actually the best part of the avocado. Um, I put them into my smoothies. Seeds? Yeah, yeah. Huh? absolutely. I never throw avocado seeds out. It's the best part of the avocado. I've got a, a, a story on my blog. You can have a look about why you should be eating your seeds. Obviously, you need a good blender, though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they are hard. <laughs> they are hard. Um, but if you even have a good knife, you can, even the big, I had big avocado mm. seeds today, and I sliced through them quite easily. But please, don't throw them out. They're really, really good for you. Any other questions or comments? Hi. Well, what's your feeling on people who have gluten and non-gluten type green or I personally, I don't have any gluten. Um, I'm gluten intolerant. Um, I've had to pay the price the hard way for um, being a wog where I grew up on lots of pasta. Um, I can say that because I am one. I don't mean it in, in any other way than um, it's, it's how I grew up. I believe that the gluten-free products out there are just as dangerous as the gluten products themselves. Most of those gluten-free biscuits and crackers and cereals <coughs> are very, very high in um, uh, corn syrup. They're also very high in the wrong types of flour. So you, you're really tricking your body with the insulin again. And they also taste awful. So it's about learning how to make real food, like making real bread, making real crackers. Um, I make crackers out of flax seeds and sunflower seeds and um, almonds and they taste beautiful. You'd never ever go back to the gluten-free stuff. Um, you know, making pastas out of vegetables and, you know, so getting all the benefits. Gluten-free, no. Not commercial gluten-free. Yes. Gre okay. Having a gluten-free lifestyle is of benefit to everybody. Because as I said, the wheat we grow today is nothing like the wheat our ancestors grew. It really does cause sugar spiking in our system. And you've experienced that yourself. Yeah. Um, don't you use flour then, or is there a particular flour? Yeah, I do use flour. I use, um, depends on what I'm making. Um, for, and I actually, and, I, and I'm actually really busy. So guys, when I say I make these things, I, ha I have lived the same busy lifestyles as you, but I'm also, because I'm a legal studies teacher and a business teacher, I always look at value for money. I just can't help it. It was also <laughs> part of the way I grew up when my mother really taught me the value of money. So I can't go to the, the stores and buy the, the gluten-free flours because they're just so damn expensive. So I just make my own chickpea flour out of chickpeas or coconut out of coconut flour. So it depends what you're, you're um, after and it depends on the denseness of the food. You know, if you're after a... Um, I, I made a chocolate um, cake a couple of weeks ago for my nephew. It was his birthday. And I made it out of chickpeas. Um, it was beautiful. It was so moist. It was lovely. High protein. It was demolished. It was only when um, they went to have a second piece, some people were lucky enough to have a second piece, and my nephew said, oh, Auntie Anne, that was really, really nice. And then he said, but knowing you, there was probably something really weird in it. <laughs> <laughs> and when he found out it was made out of chickpeas, he goes, you've got to be joking, because he hates chickpeas. <laughs> so there's, it's learning how to replace things, and don't be afraid to play in your kitchen and experiment. If something doesn't work out, you learn, and you try something different next time. Um, chick chickpea flour is probably my um, favourite and coconut flour, the two that I use a lot of. I also use a lot of um, sunflower seed flour in, in my crackers, again, just mixing them in the Vitamix, um, co combining different flours depending on the density of what you want as well. So a bit of sunflower seeds, a little bit of flax seed, um, some um, quinoa, I make my own quinoa flour because it's very high in protein. So you can have all these wonderful things. It's just about learning how to do it differently to the way that we used to do it. And that was what I was saying before about finding foods you love. Because I know when I gave up my gluten lifestyle, um, my thing was giving up pasta. That was always my go-to comfort food. And, you know, I, I love pasta. And I really thought I would struggle with it. But then once I gave it up and I realised how well I felt not eating it and I, all the problems I've experienced all my life, which were so... 100% related to gluten. I don't have those cravings anymore. I still have pasta, but I just don't have it the way that I used to have it. You know, I usually have raw pasta, which tastes really, really good. You know, pasta made out of pumpkin or zucchini or carrots. It's learning how to use those vegetables well and put the flavour into the food. Um, I made a uh, 
a pasta a couple of weeks ago that had um, meatballs. That so was my version of um, spaghetti bolognese. But the meatballs were made from walnuts and mushrooms, and the, the pasta was made from zucchini and pumpkin, and it, it all got demolished. You know, everyone loved it. Um, I, when I entertain, I entertain that way, you know, and people just don't need to be polite. I mean, if they're having seconds, you know they like it. No one has to have seconds if they don't like it. So it's about just make time in your kitchen, make your kitchen your friend. You know, we really need to get back to preparing our own food and finding out the flavours of food and food combining. Do you, sorry, do you have a cookbook out? Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> 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 uh, um, um, I don't have a, a book out. I have a lot of recipes up on my um, website and on Facebook. Um, I'm thinking it's something I might actually do later on um, when I have a little bit more downtime. Um, I'm transitioning out of um, teaching into health full time because it's where my passion really is. And for me, the, the, the need for the book has actually been driven by the lack of choices out there. When I went gluten free and I couldn't find anything I liked, I had to learn how to play with food in my kitchen. Um, even just on the weekend, I was very, very, I actually had a very um, stressful last few days. I've lost a, a close family member and, you know, just things were just up and down and I had to go into my kitchen to unwind and just, you know, create something and that just centred me, um, you know, whereas the old me would have maybe reach for a glass of wine and a piece of cheese, or actually the old me probably wouldn't have eaten at all. When the old me, when I was stressed, I didn't like food because it used to make me feel sick. Um, whereas that centering in my kitchen just grounded me and just gave me the ability to breathe properly. So and a lot of the foods I make, by the way, are actually really time efficient. They're time efficient in that they take very little time to prepare, but you've got to be patient because I use a lot of um, foods that dehydrate, so they will um, you know, it'll take you 10 or 12 hours before you can eat it, but it only takes you, it's like those burgers I had up there, literally, it takes me two minutes to make them. But it takes, oh, those burgers were actually not dry, but the um, meatballs and the pasta, they had to be dry for six hours. So you do need to think ahead um, about, you know, your foods and, and just be organised. Always make sure you have the right ingredients in your pantry and your fridge. should be where most of your food is because it should be fresh. I saw one other hand. That would be a good uh, topic for a workshop, how to stock your pantry and yes. how to prepare and how to, you know, Actually, you're right, this. yes. Yeah. I mean, ingredients, what do you normally use? Normally yes. Normally use yes. I'm happy to um, share that at a, at a future. And I'll, I, I'm very happy to just create a, a tool that you can use, like a checklist. Um, when you start living that way too, your shopping bills decrease. You, you shop very differently. I tend to shop on the outside of the supermarket. I very rarely go down that middle section of the supermarket. Um, you, 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 and you shop a little bit more frequently because you're stopping to get fresh produce. Um, that's why I like my dehydrator because I can also dry a lot of foods. So it preserves the foods. Um, I just find it, for me, it works. And I'm not saying, and I, I'm a big believer, and I've said this to you before if you came to my previous workshop, I don't preach being a vegetarian or being a vegan or being raw food. Everybody is different. There are people in here where raw food is going to be totally the wrong thing for you. Your, your gut won't be able to handle it because you need to have good digestive um, enzymes happening in your, in your body to be able to digest raw food. You will need to have um, protein from animal sources in your diet. But there are other people in here where um, a high protein um, diet will work. There are other people where it's going to be more raw foods or um, a balance of paleo, you know, wonderful benefits of following a paleo lifestyle. There's so many diet theories out there. They all have benefits. You just have to find out what works for you. Any last questions? Uh, I've just started doing the green smoothies. What do you recommend in yours? Like, what do you put in yours? Again, you can go online and, and have a look. I've got a couple of um, recipes up there. My typical green smoothie, um, the one I had this morning was just kale. So um, I think I had about three um, kale leaves. Always take the stalk out though, because it's very bitter. Um, I threw in um, celery. I actually, and this is how I, because I am busy. Um, so I actually prepare a lot of my smoothies on the weekend. So I will get my vegetables cut up in snap block bags, 
Set them in the freezer. It gives me the benefit too that they're nice and cold when I go to drink them. So the, today's one was, was celery, kale, a little bit of cucumber, some turmeric, some coconut water, a tablespoon of um, coconut oil. I also threw in some maca because maca is really, really good calcium source, really good for our bones. Um, and I threw in some bee pollen. Um, now they're superfoods, and I'm going to do a, a workshop in the future about superfoods. You don't have to have the bee pollen in the mac. It doesn't make any difference for the taste. I just put it in for extra nutrients. And I had um, half a pear. So <coughs> the trick is to, with your smoothies, not to fill them up with too much fruit because you're, you know, spiking your sugar. You know, boost juice. Not as healthy as it looks. Um, I think they've only got one green juice on their entire menu. It's um. In fact, they've got more sugar than a can of Coke. So I'm not saying drink Coke over Boost juice, but I'm just saying it's fruit juices aren't as good for you as... Um. The other thing too, just on juicing, rotate your greens, because a lot of greens do contain oxalate, which are, which are not good for us. They can cause kidney stones and gallbladder problems, so rotate your greens. Cow you can have till the cows come home. You can have it every single day, but don't have... Um, for example, Swiss Spinach. chard, spinach. spinach, it's very high. So rotate. Yep. Some days have a, um, a turmeric and carrot juice, have a beetroot juice. Just mix it up. There's so many wonderful juice recipe books out there. You had one question? Yeah, I just, I can't think of the name of it, but it's an ancient grain of wheat that's supposed to be, is it low in wheat? Yes. Um, Dave? Uh, <laughs> Can you think of it? Cindy O'Meara stocks it. She's just yeah. brought it into Australia. Yeah. Um, Eggcorn, the wheat. Yeah. Um, it's the, the wheat is like the original wheat we used to have. Yeah. Um, so if you go on to Cindy O'Meara, um, John sells Cindy O'Meara's book here, Changing Habits, Changing Lives. Also, her cookbook is a very good one. Very good. One to start with. Practical very ideas. Straightforward, natural, whole foods. But her website, she's now stocking the wheat that our ancestors grew. Um, so if you don't want to get, you know, take wheat out of your diet, you can actually get the wheat from her, the flour. You know, obviously not going to be growing the wheat, but you can actually buy your flour that is very similar to what it was 200 years ago. The main reason the wheat's changed is, is higher yields. The way that we, it's all about profit. It's all also about profit. Some some disease that it wasn't. Um, yes. Used to ramp up, yes. The, yeah, I don't know what it was, ergot or something. I don't know what it was, yeah, something. But it's, again, you know, we've put our wheat into test tubes and changed it. So many of our vegetables and our grains and, and so forth, corn particularly, doesn't look anything like it did 200 years ago. Do you put your skin all with the juicing? Yep, absolutely. I said, nothing, nothing gets wasted in my house, except Even probably gold. banana skin. I don't eat that. Gold. Sorry? Or this fruit? Gold. Yeah, I, I, um, like when I'm putting my lemon in, I put the, the seeds in. I actually put the lemon skin in as well because I buy my lemons organic. Mm. Um, I actually get them usually out of my mum's garden. I know she doesn't use sprays. But um, I do, I put the seeds. A lot of the, the, the nutrients are actually in our skin. If you can't afford to buy organic, and I can't always afford to buy organic, um, just wash your vegetables and fruit in a in your sink, put some vinegar in it, let it soak for about 10-15 minutes, rinse it afterwards and you're fine. You, it's not quite as good as going organic, but it's certainly a safe way of having your vegetables by using vinegar and soaking. Any particular vinegar or just... Look, apple cider vinegar is what I recommend, but because you're, you're just using it to, you know, with, with pesticides, good old white vinegar that you can get at Coles for about $2 for 2 litres is fine you're not actually going to be drinking it. If you're going to be drinking, I drink vinegar every day. Apple cider vinegar is, is the way to go. All right, got a cool time there, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne, for Thank coming you. along. Thank you.